I'm just going to record on my computer for now. Um, but then, um, yeah, so we'll have this and, and, and um, but that, that's great. And I think, you know, we're totally, we can sort of organize a pivot Zoom session at a future time if, if there's certainly an interest in that. Um, the, other, the other thing that I saw sort of, I don't know, uh, coming over. So I think, I think if people are interested in the pivot, the pivot chat, they should sort of uh, email us and then we could sort of definitely set up a, a, a separate Zoom for that. Um, uh, I also saw sort of coming in the chat about the um, uh, coding. Uh, that that Chris Orban was was kind of yeah right of the thank chat you Chris about. and I don't know if Chris if you wanted to take a couple of minutes to kind of share what what that project is about um, uh, sure thank you for for that um, so I I teach uh, freshman college physics at Ohio State and so there's a lot of overlap between the, the kind of stuff that I make for my classes and the kind of stuff that makes sense in, in high school physics. Um, and so I have a mix of activities of uh, sort of physics of, vi of video games activities. So Asteroids, Angry Birds, Pong, like all those great games have really great physics in them. And so we have really nice videos on the STEM coding YouTube channel. And I recruit um, women and underrepresented groups in STEM to be on those videos. So it's not just me up uh, there. It allows students to see people that look like themselves uh, doing coding and physics and science and, and having fun. Um, and so a lot of the activities are, are sort of more interactive than most other coding activities that you would find for uh, either high school or early college physics. There's a lot of press play and watch, which is great, um, but you can also press play and play with the game and, and build your conceptual knowledge. And so a lot of my activities are built around that premise. But then there's other activities I have that are, that, that are the press play and watch and see what happens. and you know, you don't have a cathode ray tube at home. You don't have a held Holmes coil. Um, and so you can calculate what that gyro radius is and try to make sure that the program is doing uh, what it should be doing. And so I have a variety of, of activities along those lines. I have a paper, I, I have an article that just came out this month in the Physics Teacher Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, so lots, lots of great resources. Cool. And, and the training this summer, which I put a link in the chat, uh, I'm doing online training for a few weeks this summer. And so um, feel free to reach out to me or, or Mark Hannum if you're interested in that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. So totally get, get in contact with Chris if you want more information about that. That's awesome. Um, I know we had another topic. I'm, I'm just trying to get to all the sort of RSVPs about okay. different topics. Can I actually again ask my question? So one of my, you know, the thing that I asked about, how do you actually create a community you know, in these kinds of situations, you know, because students are doing some lab on their own at their own time. But I really want to think about how to create a community. How do you get people together to actually have a discussion about things in a lab context or in a recitation context? Because you can get people to do their own thing at their own time and interact with something. But especially at this time when people are just isolated and they are getting even more anxious just being by themselves, how can we get students together with us to interact with the kinds of things that we are talking about in meaningful ways. So I would like to hear what folks are doing. Thanks. Could I jump yes. in and answer that? And I was, I was the one who was going to share about the editable uh, pictures in um, Google Docs. And I could do both these things at the same time, actually, if, if you wouldn't mind if I did that for a couple minutes. Sure. OK. I will. Um, Oh, can, would you mind turning on screen sharing again so I can share my screen there, so I can show the, uh, the docs? Should be okay now. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll try sharing my desktop because I think I'm trying to share more than one thing at the time. Okay, um, so you should see my email and a link to my Sims up there. And do you see this uh, Google Doc here too? Okay, so... Um, We've been um, meeting synchronously with our students. And so we had this fantastic studio classroom and we've been trying to figure out ways to uh, maintain that collaborative energy in this, in this new Zoom land that we're all in. And so we've started building these uh, Google Docs. And so, and what they do is we 
put them into breakout sessions on, on Zoom and they're working in groups of, you know, three, four, five, and they're working collaboratively on a document like this. So, you know, here's a nice plain mirror um, image and then we give them another one and this one, of course, is wrong. So what they do is they come over and they click on this and they edit it. And so they can go in and they can actually change the ray diagram, right? So they could go, hey, that one's not right. I'm gonna move this over here. Okay, um, and it's usually I populate it with, um, with things for them to play with. Okay, so that they mess with this and they change this. And, and so I've, I've really kind of gone overboard probably with this document. I was having so much fun with these Google Docs. Um, but there's a whole sequence of these, right? So that was the plane mirror, and then we went through spherical mirrors, and so you go on and on in this document, and there's, if I can scroll properly, it's, uh, you know, you get to diverging mirrors and converging mirrors. So just let me show you for a minute how you actually do it, okay? So you just come here, and maybe everybody knows this, but I only found this out recently, so just in case there's someone else like me, you insert a drawing, and I'm gonna do a new drawing. And I always create kind of a background image for them to play with. So I'll go grab one of those from my computer. And so I just upload it. And I've created, uh, you know, several of these. So I've got, you know, a converging lens template, for instance. So I'll put that one in there. And then, so that comes up with, you know, no object, no rays. But then you can draw on top of it, right? So you can just pick, you know, lines and arrows and shapes. From, from these uh, menus and you can add them. And uh, so often, again, I pre-populate these with things in the wrong place and I have the students come along and edit these and uh, create kind of a, a finished product. Um, but it's been working really very well. Um, they've been pretty involved in these breakout sessions, pretty engaged. And uh, so that's, I think, a, ni a nice way to do it. So it's very simple. So you're saying that these breakout room, uh, rooms have like three or four students working on these things together. That's right. And when you bring them back into the same room, then what kinds of discussions are you having there? Yeah, and, and uh, so it's, I've, got, I've got me and two grad students and two undergraduate learning assistants, and we're dealing with like 80 students. So we have like, like 17, 18 rooms. So what we do is we hop from room to room and we interact with the students while they're working on these uh, packets. So usually when we come back, we've actually often wrapped up the discussion, but usually when we come back, there's, there's something that, that we need to spend 10, 15 minutes on. So we don't go through the whole packet usually. We've addressed a lot of the questions along the way, um, but anything that you know, really needs to be addressed as a group, we'll do that for a few minutes at the end. Yeah. That's great, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I did see, um, I don't know if I know how to say her, your name, I think, yeah, uh, Frozen? Yes. Frozen. Yeah. Okay, I think she wanted to say something, and then I saw two hands. I saw yeah. uh, Valerie's hand, and I saw Drew's hand. So can we go in that order? Is that cool? Sure. Um, I just wanted to answer, uh, Chandra, what, what I have been doing. So I have been teaching for three weeks now online. I teach at Santa Monica College. Um, I have found that uh, doing, uh, you know, classes at the time of the class works well. I also do uh, use the breakout rooms. For the labs, uh, we used to have labs every Thursday. So I still do that every Thursday. I video the last few days that I had access to my classroom, I actually went and videotaped the labs that I could just taking data. So I videotaped it and then I put that on. I have, uh, I put the links uh, earlier today um, in the chat for you for the ones that I have done already. I have five more to do. Uh, my um, uh, 14 year old helped me <laughs> put the videos together. But um, so then during the lab time, my students go and you know, you know they, they go look at the video and I'm there in case anybody has any questions, they can come back and ask questions. And during the lecture, again, it's live. I put them in rooms to talk to each other and I'm there. Uh, some of the labs that I haven't done, um, you know, for using um, uh, other sources, I go and do it myself and 
you know, again, while they're doing it, I'm there as, you know, if they need to um, come back to me. We use, um, um, we have a learning system that's called Canvas, and that has mm -hmm. been he very helpful where I can post things for them and, you know, um, these videos and the, the, the lab uh, questions, etc. I post them there and all of my students have access to that. So I just that's wanted awesome. to share that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I think I saw I saw Valerie's Valerie Otero's hand okay. up, and then we'll go for Drew Milsom's. All right. So Valerie. I was just going to say a couple things. One of them is, um, well, just to follow up on the learning assistant thing is um, the learning assistants have, are learning a lot. They're learning a lot about how they can be helpful and how they uh, some things that are working, some things that are not working, and how they can help faculty and students and. Um, we've been doing these learning assistant panels, and there's a national LA panel that's going on on Thursday, if people are interested in showing up to that. And uh, they basically talk about, you know, they've got the student's perspective on how students are experiencing your remote instruction and or their, you know, faculty's remote instruction. But they also have the LA view. And they've just run into all kinds of challenges, for example, the health rooms, um, they were doing a health room and all these students were supposed to show up and uh, that didn't work. So they kind of all the LA's hang out until students come and then they put them in groups. And so they're, they just have a lot, a, a lot of different things to share. The other thing I wanted to say was async, uh, synchronous models are a challenge for a lot of people. And certainly for the high school teachers that we're working with, um, the high school physics teachers that we're working with, they're, they're not doing synchronous because it's not going to happen. And so they've, they've come up with all kinds of strategies, like having students just do little quick videotapes of themselves or audio tapes of themselves explaining the consensus question and then posting it. And then some other student has to come and comment on this, but it's still a community board with everybody's discussion of a different problem. And so it does provide an opportunity for an asynchronous collaborative community uh, in a situation when you can't do that otherwise. Cool. Thanks, and, Valerie. And I think yeah. that doing some of that will also help in cases in which not all the students could be present synchronously, right? Because it's possible that some of them just can't make it at a certain time, especially in these times, right? So that's exactly. A or, or they have they live in a one room apartment with their mother and grandmother, and so it just doesn't work. And I also I, I posted Thanks. the link to some resources that the Learning Assistant Alliance has, um, which has info about the panel as well, uh, into the chat. Um, yeah. And then I think we got Drew Milson who's going to come. Uh, hi, everyone. Hey. So I, I'm not teaching this semester, but I pretty much know what all our faculty are doing. Uh, some of the lectures being given are asynchronous, some are synchronous. Uh, you know, partly just a matter of like, people don't want to be in the physics building to do demonstrations or anything, and they have trouble doing stuff at home synchronously. But all of our weekly discussion sections are synchronous right now. Uh, unlike the earlier speaker, we don't have learning assistants hopping from breakout room to breakout room. You, basically what we end up with is breakout rooms with more like 10 students in them. So it's obviously not ideal, but it's sort of about the best we can do. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how well that's actually going because obviously some of the people may not really participate, but they're- so What, what are you getting them to do, Drew, in, in those uh, breakout rooms we have, of 10? I mean, a lot of them are things that I wrote, but they're sort of like UW t tutorial kind of things. And, and they would normally work on those for 50 minutes anyways. So there's, there's usually no, t there's no coming back to the whole group, like all 100 people. You just have the 10 people at once only in like a small discussion. So it's group activities the whole period. It's just now groups of 10 instead of groups of four. So clearly it's not as effective, right? Um, but that's where they are at this point anyways. The other thing is, you know, usually we would, it was much easier to make people collaborate in the real world, right? we'd say, look, you know, you guys are going to turn in one activity for the four of you and everybody gets the same grade, all right? And that way they have to help each other and we'd randomly choose whose work we collected. Now, of course, everyone's just sort of getting credit for showing up on Zoom because there's not really any easy way to do this. So you can't really be sure if everyone's actually doing stuff, but it's sort of the best I think people will be able to come up with. The laboratory is a whole other story. Um, as far as I know, all they're doing at this point is videotaping someone performing the experiment and setting the students' data. 
And so I can guarantee there's probably, there's no official interaction between students in the lab other than probably them emailing each other saying, how do you answer this question kind of thing. But there's nothing we're doing that really encourages interaction in the lab. I know the lab director is trying to find some other model for the summer classes, but I'm not sure what he's going to do at this point. But that's where we are right now. Thanks so much. Sure. Oh yes, uh, I see. I see Phil's hand up. I would like to ask a question about the student interaction. If if graphics um, and you know drawing on on whiteboards and drawing on paper um, is something that's lacking in uh, in the interactive uh, mm. activities. And, and you, can you do it on a computer? I mean, I have a graphics tablet, but I don't think many people do. Yeah, I don't know if folks have thoughts on that. that I know Zoom has a whiteboard. I don't know if folks have explored that or... Um... It, it's great yeah. for ba yeah. breakout rooms, you know, when you're in a breakout room with, with students or if, you have, if, you're, if you're trying to do lecture, then you need a tablet so you could do your own drawing. But if you're just using a computer, the back, the, the breakout uh, documents, the breakout room whiteboard has been great for the smaller collaborative groups. They download it after they're done. They modify each other's work and they, they have a record of the conversations they had. So one of the, um, the problems that a lot of uh, K-12 institutions are are working with is they are, I think, rightfully more concerned about student privacy and, and kind of Zoom bombing and things like that. So uh, many of them are, are not um, encouraging the use of Zoom because of security issues, and they're forcing people into much more lockdown systems like Blackboard or Canvas or um, um, other things, even uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, you know, does anyone have experiences doing these types of collaborative activities in those other structures, not Zoom? I, I can mention a, an easy thing that I think we do in terms, we were, we're on Moodle, right? But uh, I mean, I think all these learning management systems have the similar feature and we do sort of um, discussions on, on Moodle where you know, students will post and have to respond to each other and can post pictures and stuff like that. But, but I think, I mean, one of the, I think, important things is like um, sort of supporting students to kind of respond to each other. You have to kind of, I think, put prompts in for those sort of things to encourage that kind of discussion. Um, I don't know if folks have experience with other systems or... So I guess the question is, is in, in um, Blackboard Collaborate or Microsoft Teams or things like that, is there features for whiteboarding mm -hmm. and, yeah. and sharing and, and features that, that allow students that, that conversation and that interaction between each other that we all want? I mean, there definitely are collaborative features in Blackboard and Canvas but I think I like Zoom much better, these breakout room features. Yeah. The problem that I have oh, yeah. is that I teach at a community college in a rural area of Eastern North Carolina, and I don't even have fast internet at my home. Um, I snuck into school to attend this coffee hour right now, and most of my students if they are doing their work online, they are doing it off of their phones because they don't have high speed internet. So we have not, some teachers here have done uh, some things synchronously, but I've polled several students in a variety of my classes and they're, they were fine if I wanted to do that, but um, I've been available for them, but I've not done anything synchronously. Yeah, I think a, Janet, Janet, yeah. Yeah, let me just add a little comment. Uh, I'm retired, I don't do anything. So I'm here today as the sponge for colleagues who are on the front lines. <laughs> uh, one of the main problems that uh, they have is that they basically are using 
Blackboard still, I'm not sure what version, but um, one of the big problems is that not all the students have access to a webcam. So yeah. that doing something face to face, even with Zoom for the students or, or FaceTime or anything else like that, if you can't do it with everybody, you can't do it. And mm -hmm. so that, that's a real problem. And so trying to get around that, you can do things one to one, but then you're leaving out, you're leaving out other students. You can answer questions. But um, that was a problem also when I was teaching astronomy online back in the dark ages too. So just to put that in, so I sympathize with my colleagues who have um, broadband problems as well. Yeah, I wonder, you know, I, I hear about colleagues using sort of the cameras on their phone as a, as a document, as a document camera, right? That, that kind of, you know, you could see everything. And I wonder, I wonder if that's a way to sort of do something like that. And I'm wondering sort of like, what other things can students do with their phone where they can share with others? And, and I'm sort of thinking about like, if I take a picture of something, a shared album where the photos go through through Google where students can kind of see each other's shared album and their work. And I'm just, yeah, I haven't really thought about this, but there seem to be some, maybe some other ways that people can use phones to sort of do that sort of collaborative yeah. Um, work. I mean, I think, yeah, phones. Yeah, Mark. I'm hoping to do with, uh, with my students is use the uh, accelerometers in the phones and do experiments that way. Mm -hmm. You know, normally at the end of the year, I'm a high school teacher. At the end of the year, I take my kids to amusement park and we do uh, real stuff there. And, you know, we use the PASCO system and uh, with Capstone. And uh, so, you know, this year I had this happen for when we got rained out, you know, go, I mean, now it's a little sketchy, but you know, if you can get to a playground, get on a swing, uh, you know, merry-go-round, jump on a trampoline, whatever, you can take data. And, um, you know, I'm setting up a Dropbox sharing so kids can uh, share the, the capstone files. Um, I'm hoping they can even collaborate a little and produce a presentation like they normally do. So yeah. they can also do slow motion videos of projectiles, for example, and analyze yeah. those data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you can do a lot with just the internal sensors and the video and uh, you can combine that stuff together. Uh, the only thing like we use, uh, you know, when you use the accelerometers on the phone and, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. The, uh, we use the, uh, what's called the SparkView app, which goes with the PASCO system. The, the one drawback at this point is that it, for some reason it still doesn't access the gyroscope. Uh, and I hope they'll add that at some point, but then, mm -hmm. Ultimately, you can open up those files in, uh, in Capstone so you can do a more sophisticated analysis. So, so I see Andrew's hand and I should say okay. like if you also, I can't see everybody's faces, right. but if you raise your hand in the, uh, in the chat box, uh, I, I can make sure to call on you. I oh, see Mike I Hall see. coming after Andrew as well. So Andrew, okay. yeah. Just very briefly, um, Sensor Kinetics, great app. You can, it gives you the three components of the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, really fun if you take a field trip to uh, the Southern Hemisphere, you know, and see the sign change on the magnetic field, you know, and stuff like that. So a lot of cool stuff from Sensor Kinetics, that's all. Cool, that's great. Free yeah, app. If you, and if you, have a, if you have a link, Andrew, maybe if you can post it in the chat. I, I, what I did, I posted in the oh, chat Sensor cool. Kinetics, just to put it under Google awesome. or something. That's yeah. fantastic. Cool. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, Mike, excuse me, Apple oh, yeah. Store, Apple Store, Apple Store, and the um, and Android. Perfect. You Perfect. know, Google, whatever Google Store, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Mike Hall, I, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, I just I just wanted to make sure that everybody is uh, accessing the the chat part of this because as oh, yeah. as people are talking, uh, people are posting all kinds of great links and ideas. So make sure you're looking at the chat. Yeah, and maybe I can ask a technical question. Can we, we can save the chat you as can, well? Yeah, we can I'm download sorry. it. Just yes. down. Ex excuse me, download. I've just been bringing my cursor down, highlighting it, cop, and pasting oh, it into a Word file. That way. It, as fast as fast can be. Yeah, but maybe you, we can it, send wait, it out the, to people. Yeah, yeah you can ahead. also it downloads, it'll download as a separate file. I if wonder, you go to right. the very bottom of yeah, the Yeah, it says save chat. chat. And if you Save chat. Yes. Yes. Very bottom. Excellent. Awesome. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Great. 
we're talking about phones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's the Pasco stuff, but there's also the Vernier stuff. So we use Vernier's graphical analysis, which is free and is always free. Um, and then Vernier has made their video analysis app free for the time. And those mm. are both really good ways to do video analysis or to use uh, the accelerometers in a phone. Great. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, yeah. a little bit more complicated solution, but maybe for if you're dealing with um, students that are in your in your majors classes, not necessarily the general population, but the MATLAB app, which is free if you have a MATLAB license, mm -hmm. that also gives you access to all the phone sensors. And I've used that a lot with students, particularly because it um, exports everything right to the MATLAB cloud, and then you can process it really nicely if you've got MATLAB already installed. Um, once again, I realize MATLAB is not the universal solution here as some of the other ones that are mentioned, but if you're dealing with um, uh, other people, uh, some of your students that are more advanced or your majors that have access to MATLAB and things like that, it's, it's a pretty good solution. Uh, someone asked a question about Octave. I don't know. It seems like if Octave has an app, uh, they might be able to do that too. I mean, Octave is great. Uh, it's a What is Octave? Can you, can, is, is there a way to briefly uh, describe? Octave is essentially open source MATLAB. Oh, got it, got it, got it. it it's, every, it's everything that MATLAB is, but free. Got it. It even re it reads MATLAB files. Um, I, oh yeah, uh, Mark. Yeah, I should point out to the, uh, since I was talking about the Pasco system with Capstone, the, uh, the, the app, the uh, SparkView app that you collect the data on is free actually on, um, uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, Chromebook and Android and uh, iPad and all that. And if you're only temporarily using it, you can get the desktop version also as a trial for six months. So. Um, mm -hmm. See, uh, as we we're discussing all these apps and things, does anyone have an example of students doing an at-home experience where they made use of some of these apps or collected data on their own rather than um, uh, having it be uh, synchronous, but more of an asynchronous approach? I did. Uh, Peter? Yeah. Peter? Peter, I, yeah, I, you want I, to describe and then I think Chris can describe? Oh, okay, sure. I didn't cool. mean to step on Christmas. No, no, you're good. You're good. Cool. Peter, go ahead. Uh, so I, I asked my students to uh, do an experiment. I didn't give, I, I asked them to find a bouncy ball and uh, answer the question of what's the, does the coefficient of restitution depend on the release height? And I didn't give them any more than that. I didn't give them the definition of coefficient of restitution or how to measure it, but I did constrain them to saying that the only thing that they could use to measure is uh, a piece of notebook paper taped against the wall uh, or multiple pieces of no notebook paper taped against the wall. Yeah, cool. And uh, I let them loose with that and uh, it was sort of a synchronous, asynchronous. They would come back and uh, uh, discuss about every 15 minutes about their progress. And then they were entering their data uh, online so I could view their data and share the data as they collected first, first their experimental designs and then their data. It was really fun because yeah. it was a, a mixture of being able to share data and ideas, but collecting data uh, on our own with a real, real event. So it was, I thought it was a great success. That's cool. Can you, can you talk about the level of student? Is this um, intro this is advanced a, yeah, or? It's a concurrent enrollment uh, college course in a high school. So University oh, yeah. of Minnesota, Got their it. first semester algebra based course. Uh, I teach it uh, to high school students. Cool. Awesome. It wasn't my idea. That's a question that's so interesting because I was writing with one of the readers on the, from the AP1 exam who graded that question. That's a question off of an AP1 exam, an experimental nice. design question. So it was really nice to get a perspective of what it looked like to grade, you know, 100,000 of those. So I learned a lot about 
how to modify the question to make it sort of more manageable. So uh, cool. that was a lucky, lucky that I ran into that person. Nice. Um, I saw I saw Chris Chris Orban's hand up. Uh, um, so I, I I put a link into the chat uh, with an activity I, I call it the Barometer Lab, and so students use the pressure sensor on their uh, on their smartphones, their iPads, and then they they go up a flight of stairs and they measure the pressure difference, or maybe they go into the basement and they go to the ground floor, um, and then they measure the difference in pressure and then they use that to try to extrapolate how high the edge of space is above the earth, which is kind of fun. Nice. I mean, it's, it's a very crude measurement, but, uh, but it's just fun that you can walk up and down the stairs and use that to estimate how high space is. And there's other people that are more clever than I am who, uh, who do all sorts of other sophisticated things with pressure sensors of like putting smartphones inside of a Ziploc container and putting a weight on top of it to see how that affects the pressure. Um, there's other people that I think they put their phones in a sealed container and put it in like a bucket of water and to measure the hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of the water. I don't know that I'm that daring enough yeah. to do that myself, uh, but there's a lot of great stuff out there that you can find on the physics teacher mag. Great. I, I also know like, so the, and maybe someone, uh, if someone attended the committee on two-year college Zoom meeting, on Friday, I think that was the topic of their discussion, and I believe it's it's been recorded and it's on their website. So that's another maybe resource for for doing labs outside of the um, doing labs at home, basically. Um, I don't know if anybody was there, and oh yeah, Rogers was there. Or, yeah, I don't know if you have any other feedback, Rogers, about that session or like. No, it was it was great. Um, Tom yeah. was there as well, so mm -hmm. we actually we got Zoom bombed for about ten seconds. Yeah, <laughs> we learned how to un how to do that. But it was <laughs> actually it was it was great. Um, Kendra kind of drove most of it uh -huh. and had some really really good um, suggestions on kind of like wandering around your house and picking up what you can pick up in your house in the laundry room and things like that, and how to incorporate cool. incorporate that in the into into the labs. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of at a at a crossroads because when all of this sort of began to fall out in, in March was about the point she was showing her syllabus and that was about the point where she was really getting heavy into the lab. So she had to do a lot of um, reconfiguring on the fly. So it was very good. That's great. Well attended too. Cool. Yeah, and I, I can post the link to the committee on two hey, colleges. Yeah. yeah, that that has that too. You might want to reach out maybe to Kendra to see what, what, um, because she had some slides, I think, that she put up there. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah, any, I mean, there was, there was some other like really interesting, I think, questions, but I don't see the, I don't know if someone else had something that they wanted to share that a topic or. I would, I would love to hear from Peter yeah. Mahatrick about the pivot yeah. if uh, we have a few minutes. Sure, yeah. Peter, would you be willing to talk about pivot a little bit? Uh, I would, I, I would be very happy to talk about it. It's a, a little bit awkward because I know it's not, it's not permanently free. And so mm -hmm. I know that mm -hmm. I, I think it's really nice to be able to share free things and to use as a teacher to find free things. And so I, I realize that there's always that, that you know, Am I here to sell something? And I, I'm, I'm not, uh, but I guess it is something that if you decide to use it for a longer period of time than the 30 day free trial, it, it, it costs money. So I just want to preface it with that. But the goal of it is to, is to try to let students do true investigation and you know, authentic science uh, remotely. And so here we are in a time when that's something that's really in demand. So if, uh, can I share my screen? I'll just show one quick example. And then I want to make sure that uh, everybody has a chance to get the links to the free trial and try that because ideally that'll get you through this, uh, uh, this whole thing. Uh, so um, yeah, would people be interested in seeing that one quick example? If, if Mel, if you'd share the share a screen. That yeah, I, could... I think, I think Mark, Mark gave you uh, access to do that. I think oh, at the bottom, you, you should, should see the you green be button. Able to... Oh, you I see it. I sure do. Green share. Yeah, cool. Yep. Thank you.
Uh, okay, so this is the library of Pivot, Pivot Interactive's activities. And uh, so uh, it's across the, the whole physics, uh, all the physics topics that are in an intro curriculum. Uh, so you would, by, when you do your free trial, you'll see this, this library and you can search by uh, physics content area. So I don't know, what's one that's hard for people to do uh there's a pretty nice induction one so for induction we have a couple of different ones but uh this one here we wanted to really be able to show what the, the mathematical relationship that underlies induction so uh we have some introductory text here that the students can look at and you as a teacher you can modify that uh, and then uh, this shows the apparatus that we use here is uh, a glider on an air track mm -hmm. and it has a, uh, a hoop on it, a rectangular hoop, and then it's gonna glide through a, a magnetic gap made of neodymium magnets. And so then you can see this voltmeter go from showing essentially nothing to a voltage in one direction. And then as the, coil is completely immersed, it goes back to zero and then goes in the other direction when it comes out. And so then the idea here is that students can make measurements so they can measure the area and they can also using a stopwatch and they're measuring the velocity of this, they can make measure the rate of change uh, of that area that's immersed in that. Uh, and then here they can choose different trials so they can vary the speed at which it's moving. It just got pushed through at various random speeds. And so down here, they're gonna make a data table that maybe plots the rate of change of area and the uh, EMF. And so they'll discover for themselves uh, what they, in this case, what they'll do is figure out what the strength of the magnetic field is inside that magnetic gap. Uh, and then in part two, we, because this gap, we had no idea what the magnetic field really was inside that. So we set up a second experiment where a current, a varying current is passed through a conductor with this same gap sitting on a scale. And so now, again, the students can do a graph here of the force versus the current. And it's super cool because they get the same value for the strength of the field in this experiment that they do in, in the first one. So uh, the idea is to sort of have it be, you know, true, the same kinds of things that we would do in lab. Uh, but students are, they are making their own measurements, they're making their own choices about what gets graphed and how they measure, uh, but the, the uh, videos are uh, with the apparatus already set up and going. So that's, that's the idea, and there are 190 of them in, uh, in physics, I think pretty much all of the intro topics we have somewhere or another covered in that. So uh, I don't want to take too much time, so I'll stop sharing from there. Happy to answer questions, and I'll post a link for how to get a free trial in the in the bottom. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's uh, and we, uh, on that free trial link is also all the rest of the information about right, pricing yeah, and everything prices, like yeah. that. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I was hoping yeah. to, show, but I hope it's useful. That's our goal. It has always been to try to make something useful for the physics teaching community. That's awesome. Cool. Um, I think. I want to be respectful of everybody's time, and I think we're 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 approaching that the hour. So this was really great. Uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody for all the awesome contributions. There's a ton of stuff in the in the chat, so I encourage folks to download the chat. Um, you know, if 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 people want to have more in-depth discussions about certain things you know let, let us let us know and I, you know we can certainly try to put those things to kind of together for folks um but yeah there's we're gonna do this again where the plan is to do this every week uh so look out for emails and and uh yeah i, I don't know anything else folks wanted to add uh yeah i mean we're looking forward to next week and and uh one of the hosts for next week, Danny, is on right now. He can wave oh, yes. hi. And, uh, but there's uh, others, some two other teachers um, that are going to be uh, there as well. And I think it's going to be another great conversation. It might be a completely different one than this one, but it'll be, you know, another way for us to, to share and to talk and to be a community. Nice. And, and thanks to Mark, who kind of jumped in at the last minute to yeah, facilitate this, too. We really, yeah. he was, and Mike Hall, my boss.
Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. How do we uh, access oh. the recording? Oh, the, the record. Video? Yeah. So we'll. Uh, yeah. Good question. Uh, I. I. It'll come to my computer, and then I will share it with APT, and we will get a message out to folks where they can get it. You know, APT's got a YouTube site, um, so it's probably likely that it'll go up there, and then we'll send folks the link. Okay. Does that sounds so reasonable. Yeah. Sounds great. Perfect. Just, just to I let everybody know, if I I can, you know, we're we're telecommuting the office is telecommuting but we're not that big of an organization and believe me if you send a question or if you call and leave a message we'll, we'll get right back to you so i mean for anything like this we're we're on top of it for you guys awesome and um i i have saved the chat um, and we will find a way to post it but of course all of you can save your own versions if you just go down to the chat box and hit the three little dots uh, and say save chat and then i think you get your own version Oh, yeah, it goes in Windows. It goes to my documents on the Zoom folder. Right. Yeah. Same. You just did it. It's really easy. Yeah. So that, I don't cool. know what file format it is in, though. That's yeah. it's, it's in a it's a, a text dot txt. Is so it okay. super, super basic <laughs> formatting, but it's right. all there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all you need anyway. So. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. You know, I, I love all, right. all the expertise in the organization. It's awesome. So it's good Thank to see you. folks and hope everybody Thank stays you. safe. Glad Thank to have the company. So Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Be Bye. safe. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks.